Thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, every time I do something like this, I tend to want to try a new something because I like new things. We've had this conversation. Like, uh, I like to try new things. So I'm going to have you be... Um, I have a friend who uses this tool called Slido. Anybody used it? Yeah? Yeah. So, so Judy's used it. Yeah. So, um, and the reason I thought about this tool was actually yesterday. Can you hear me okay, by the way? Yeah. Um, so, was, no, it was, it was Monday when um, Dorothy was giving her lecture, right? And she, I, I spoke with her a little bit afterward, and she was like, it's very hard for, from a broad camera shot, it's very hard to get feedback from, from the room, right? So, I mean, and people are working on new technologies for that, just for the record. Uh, we don't have it here, but um, they now have, funny enough, drone cameras that will fly around the room. <laughs> they're, vo they're voice activated. Yeah? How cool is that, right? Um, so, we don't have any of those here. Um, but I was thinking to myself, one of the things I love when I'm working with a group of folks is, I want to see hands, I want to hear what people have to sort of, what, what their experience has been, I want to get a sense of how they're already thinking of a topic. Um, so, and that's difficult for Dorothy to do because we couldn't shout at her, we don't even have a mic in the room for her to hear. So I thought, oh, one thing that we could do in that situation is have a polling tool, right? Where, where somebody who's, who's not here, I'm going to do it in the room because I want to try it out, but so Dorothy could say, here's a poll I want everybody to participate in. And all of us on our devices could easily, you can easily join this, and I'll show you how. And then we can give her feedback that will show right on the screen for all of us. So we'll see all that happen, which is, I think, really cool. So um, Slido is one of these tools. So here's what I want you to do for anybody who has a device um, and who is willing to participate. And by device, I mean one connected to the internet. There are lots of other devices, right? Notebooks are devices, pens are devices, that sort of thing. So anybody who has that thing connected to the internet, go to um, sli.do in a browser. And, what? SLI.do. Yep, sli.do. And um, that'll take you to this page here. Should, at least. Huh? Just, just sli.do. Yep. Yeah, and they want, they want this code, right? Our code, our event code is NSTS3 for day three. So just NSTS3. And that should take you to, um, I'm going to do it too, because I'm going to, that should take you to a, um, yeah. yeah, so it should take you to a place where you can enter in word or words that describe your feelings about online learning. So put in one word at a time, or one or two words, phrases, things like that, on how, what, what, what is it you think or feel about online learning, and it's going to map these right here on the screen for us. I'm going to do it too. Oh, yeah, I don't know what that is. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so once people, yeah, see? Yeah, how cool is this? Oh, look. We're getting doubles, right? So, yes. <laughs> I love it. Wow. Efficient. People think efficient. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. This is great. I, this is the first time I've ever used this, by the way. I love this. I super love it. Yeah. So, <laughs> meh. I like the meh. Whoever did that. It's pretty good. Um, number, that's the total. So, number in the top right is the total number of um, uh, submissions. Or, actually, I think that's unique users. Unique um, devices, I think, because if you meant if you made plenty of words, it's going to not count you multiple times. I don't think. I didn't check that though. Um, 
So while you're still doing that, and we'll talk about this for a second, but just so you know, this tool also has a question part to it. So if you're doing an event or teaching a course and you don't have time for questions, like a time to stop for questions, you can, do, you can use this tool for free to have a question space as well. And you can show those questions on the screen when you're done, like when you get to a place and you can say, oh, I'm going to answer that one. I'm going to answer this one, right? Um, so that people can keep track of their questions along the way. So it's a pretty cool tool. So what this was, all, all I did was build a poll that was a word cloud poll, right? So, and the cool thing about it is, I think, when we see all the words in a disoriented, uh, disorganized fashion, but words that reoccur get bigger, right? That's how word clouds work, yeah? So, so it gives you a sense of kind of how, you know, what people are thinking about this. Oh, yeah, see, here's this one. Look at that. Yeah, and then a, oh, happy, ah, more meh. Did you just put it in like nine times? Oh, all right, I love it. Yeah, okay, so anyway, enough, enough about the tool. So these are the sorts of tools that I think um, can actually help us reimagine and or translate classroom spaces, right? So we have to think more carefully about what it's like to be together in learning spaces when we're not sitting around a table. We have to think more carefully about that. And the only people who can do that are uh, people like us who, who have taught before and who have an investment in learning spaces, right? To be honest, technologists suck at this, right? They're really bad at it because they don't really care about people by and large. They care about cool toys, right? Now I'm generalizing, I'm a technologist. I actually like people for the most part. Um, but so this is just an example of like, oh, I was thinking Dorothy, when she's giving a lecture now, she could do something like this that would give her some more feedback from us even though she's sitting somewhere far away. Those are the simple sort of things you can do to, to make changes in, in how we imagine learning spaces together. Um, what, yeah, let me just look at these a little bit. So Happy's the largest now, which that, that warms my heart a little bit. Somebody probably did that a bunch. But, but you'll notice a, a wide range of stuff here, right? And I thought it was very interesting that efficient was the biggest one for a while. Because again, most people think technologies are about efficiency, right? So, so if we think about technologies as efficient, that's fine. We do that a lot. People think that about machine learning as well. It's about efficiency, right? I think technology as efficiency is the most dehumanizing form of technology, right? So if technology is really about efficiency, and if online learning spaces are really about efficiency, then I'm out. I don't want it. Because I don't think that's really what learning is about, is about efficiency, right? So, so I would agree with the folks who put, if they put efficient, I would also put the dehumanizing. But the only word I contributed is human. Because I actually believe, and I start from a place of believing that online spaces have the potential for being deeply human spaces, right? I know a lot of people are skeptical of that, but I'm not. Uh, and I have a lot of experience with it. Um, so hopefully, and I have some theoretical background for it, um, so hopefully uh, after today we can at least have a conversation about why, why or why not it may be human. So thank you for um, being um, willing to try that with me. Um, okay, so now, here it is, translating the classroom. And I, so, let me start with, um, I do consider myself a translator, um, but I am not a literary translator, I'm not a linguistic translator at all, I don't do any of the work that many of you do professionally. But for the last decade, I have been a translator of classrooms. That's how I see my job. Um, I work with faculty uh, at an institution, and here I'll go to why bother here, why bother even talking about the classroom, why bother talking about translating the classroom, because I've been doing this for a decade. 2008, my institution, ILF School of Theology in Denver, um, gave five online courses in 2008. We started with a five course pilot, and since then, over 10 years, we now have over 70% of our registered hours are either online or hybrid. Okay, and we'll talk about terminology in a minute. So in 10 years, we've gone from five of however many courses to the majority, the vast majority of our enrolled hours being somehow related to these sorts of technologies. And to be honest, I was telling Judy earlier, the first few years we did this, we sucked at it. Right? We were really bad at it because we were thinking efficiency. right? But then I started, at the same time, 
I was, I was bumping into some, some philosophers that I'll tell you about in a minute who made me question, like, wait, maybe we're just doing this badly. Maybe it's not impossible. Maybe we're just doing it badly. So I started to believe that it was possible for us to create humanness online. And I needed a way to help faculty, so to, to decrease faculty anxiety and increase their adoption of these tools. So the, way, the methodology I used to, to try to do that was instead of this conversion language, so lots of people talk about course conversion from um, like a residential, like an in, in this kind of class to an online class. I, being a sort of recovering evangelical conversion language is really uncomfortable for me anyway. Um, but I never was happy with this language of conversion. So when I started getting involved with, with NIDA people, I thought, oh, translation's a great sort of methodology for helping faculty connect what they've always been doing to what's possible in these new spaces, right? So that's part of why I think about it as translating the classroom. Um, I also, I, always sh I like showing this video just because I think it's amazing. Today, today we celebrate the third glorious anniversary of our commitment to the legacy of our chosen learning management system. We have successfully maintained the status quo. Protected, protected by the safe system, system the is a the secure the area of the light and visual and foreign technologies. The virgins virgins flexibly estimated will only lead to idleness. We are one people, people. One, one will, one, win. one resolve, one, resolve. one call, one call. Our LMS is efficient for our needs. For our needs. It's nice, huh? Back to change. Change is good. Okay, so um, anybody know what that's a parody of? Yeah, 1984. Yeah, 1984 Apple commercial. Um, which, yeah, it's, the Apple commercials, it's, it's, it's almost the same. But the reason I show that is um, Canvas. That's from Canvas. That's from the people who build the LMS that, that NIDA uses. And I think they got it right. Um, that was the first uh, ad they ever put out, um, basically saying that Blackboard, their main competitor, uh, was, was all about conformity and efficiency, right? And Canvas said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We need to build online learning spaces that aren't about conformity and, and non-change, but let's change, let's, let's do something different. So, um, and I think change is good. I think um, a few people um, in their talks have already mentioned how translation can be a way of challenging hegemonic discourse, right? I think online learning has the potential to help us challenge the hegemonic discourse of this kind of classroom that can happen, right? It's not always that way, but I think it has the potential to do that. So sometimes change can do that. Okay, terminology. I better watch time here. Whoa. So the terms we'll throw around today um, and that you're probably familiar with um, to talk about learning spaces. There are a million of them. I didn't put them all up here. But, but the ones that people talk about the most are um, on ground, online, and then something in between. There's a million forms of hybrid, but hybrid means some version of, you know, doing this thing that we're doing and some version of doing things online. I would argue that almost all learning today is hybrid because we use online spaces for certain things, use it for research, we use it so... So in one sense, everything's hybrid. In another sense, our design is not hybrid all the time. So, and, and so online, some people call it distance learning. Um, distance learning can happen not online. Remember correspondence courses where tapes were mailed to you? Does anybody ever do one of those? Yeah, yeah. So there's all kinds of distance learning. Online is a different one. It's using online tools. Virtual, I hate the word virtual, so I rarely will use it um, because I think it was a derogatory term um, by and large, made, making sure it was different from the real, as if online spaces aren't somehow real and aren't material. Hopefully that'll be something we'll sort of we'll pound into the ground. So on ground, terrestrial, I didn't hear that one until, until you used it. Uh, traditional, residential, all that sort of stuff. All I mean by on ground is this thing, where we're in the same room together at the same time, and I can smell you. That's the way, 
That's the way I tell it because really smell is one of the only senses, taste sort of too, smell is one of the only senses we haven't figured out how to, how to mediate digitally, right? And so when, I, when, when, I, when I'm trying to talk about the different embodiment that goes on in this space and the embodiment that goes on in this space, and yes, I mean embodiment, right? It's not a disembodiment to be online. It's a different embodiment, right? But I can't smell you when I'm online. I can smell you here. So maybe I'll call it, you know, smelly classrooms <laughs> and non-smelly classrooms or something like that, right? Um, and that's so fancy, though. <laughs> so fancy. So people also talk about on ground, this thing, as face-to-face. -face. Who has heard that language before? Face-to-face -face classrooms, yeah? Many of you have had, heard that, right? Um, how many people have taken or taught an online course? I should ask that. So a good percentage, that's pretty good, yeah? Um, okay. Um, so this face-to-face -face language is typically used for what we're doing here, right? Why? Let me go, uh, let's go here. So wh why do we call that face-to-face? -face? Anyone? I'm going to type some things here while you tell me. Why do we call, why do we call this face-to-face -face and not something else? Yeah, okay. Uh, I see. So there's a screen between the faces and the other one. So here we'd say no screen. That's why we call face-to-face? -face? Wasn't, wasn't the term invented before the use of, of visual technology? Wasn't people talking yeah. about F2F when, yeah. when email and yep. texting became a big yep. thing? Text only, yeah. right? Yep. What else? Why do we call it face-to-face? Yeah, we, we assume, yeah, yes, well, uh, assumes sight, yep, yep, and not only just see, but see faces, right? I can see your facial expression, that sort of thing, so expression is one of these things too, right? Yep, body language, things like this. For more serious expression, I've got to talk to you face to face. So it's got a, more gravity, more, yeah. more gravity. Personal. More personal, <laughs> yep, more personal. Yeah, somebody else said something? I think part of that gravity also is security in some ways, where people might be fearful that something online might not get right. Yep, 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 good, good. Can I just also get into the question of presence? Presence, yeah, yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. This is perfect. You guys are the best. Nuance, tone, uh, oh. flexion, yep. So that's all kind of forms of expression, right? Yeah. Yep. Some of which, certainly early on, all of which were lost, right? When it was all text-based, right? Many, many of those things were lost. And none of us had learned new intuitions around how to communicate some of those things in text, right? Now, some of us know that. My, my kids know that pretty well, actually. And not just with emoticons, right? Although those are a thing. Yeah, so that's right. I, I, this is my experience, too, is that we, we call it face-to-face -face because of these things, right? Um, and early on, it was a really stark distinction between having really round presence together with lots and lots of ways of presencing and really just having text, right? Um, so, that, that, so that made sense. And then often people call this unmediated, right? But you all are language people. Does, is language something that it mediates between people? Like, we have to talk to each other, right? So I would even call language a technology. Earlier, we, we heard language can be a thing of violence, right? I would consider uh, uh, language a technology. So I don't think face-to-face -face is unmediated. I think it's differently mediated, right, than these other spaces. So I have grown to, um, to disdain oh, whoops, the term face-to-face uh, as used for only on ground uh, learning spaces. And I have started to ask, well, what if face to face can happen in many more ways than just this? In fact, what if it can happen better online than in this space? Is it possible? Right? So, why do I say that? Why do I, why do I say? So, 
At the same time, in 2008, when I started having to work with faculty to, to build these online learning spaces that they'd never done before, I also bumped into this, this French philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, um, who also talks about face-to-face, -face, right? Uh, or face of the other, or just the face, these sorts of things. And, and the more I spent time with this notion of face in Levinas, um, the more I thought, ah, I wonder, and by the way, he, he doesn't ever talk about technology really, hardly at all. It's not a thing he was really interested in. Um, but, but the more I thought to myself, you know what, I think this notion of face that's operative in, in Levinas might help us um, begin to, to bridge this difference between what we think is face-to-face -face here and what may be possible face-to-face -face in other spaces. So um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about um, the sort of intricacies of the philosophy of the face in Levinas. Many of you probably know this already, so you could, you could add to this um, too, and we can talk about that over, over time. But um, I do want to show sort of one, and this is Cohen translating Levinas, Richard A, there's lots of Cohen, Richard A, Cohen translating Levinas, in a set of, um, so these were radio interviews that he did with um, um, somebody in the 70s, I believe, 80s, I can't remember when. Um, but anyway, so it's Cohen translating Levinas, and he, he's responding to a question about the phenomenology of the face, as you can see at the top, and he says, I'm going to read this to you because I think it's, it's important. I do not know if one can speak of a phenomenology of the face, since phenomenology describes what appears, what we can see, right? what we can know, um, what we can comprehend. So too, I wonder if one can speak of a look turned toward the face, for the look is knowledge and perception. So for him, sight right, uh, is, is sort of the same thing as, as knowledge. Right? I think rather that access to the faith is face, not faith, oh dear, Access, although for him that's okay, probably. Access to the face is straightaway ethical. You turn yourself toward the other as toward an object, right? So that doesn't, that's not a good thing, right? When you turn yourself to the other as toward an object, when you see nose, eyes, forehead, chin, and you can describe them. So the other is an object when you can do that. The best way of encountering the other is not even to notice the color of her eyes. When one observes the color of the eyes, one is not in social relationship with the other, meaning one is not face to face. Right? So for Levinas, sight, right, or seeing, or understanding one another, right, or at least I should say the way I read Levinas' philosophy of the face, is, is, is that sight and knowledge and, and this thing here, perception, actually is not face to face. The face is that which is unseen, is impossible to see, impossible to know, impossible to comprehend, right? So, so I think that um, that notion of face gives us a, a lot of possibility to think, oh, okay, then there are ways which we can be together, be in relationship to the other, to one another, right? Not in this room, and still have it be face to face. And maybe, this is the hardest face-to-face -face relationship to have because we, we make all these assumptions about what perception does, right? We, we give so much stock to sight, right? right? Oh, I see, I, so I see what color hair you have. I see what I think your gender is, right? I see you know, certain other features, and I make all kinds of systematic categorizations already before I even know I've done it, right? So perhaps other spaces might interrupt that. Um, so let's live with that for a minute and see. We can argue about that for two weeks if we want, which would be really fun, I would love to. Okay, so another way that Levinas talks about um, face and the relation with the face is with this word proximity, okay? Um, and I, this is my favorite word um, now, I think, um, of all the words. Um, and this is a word that became really important in, in my dissertation work, and it's still important in my research um, for several reasons you, you, may, you may see. But basically, um, proximity, again, in, in the way I read Levinas, there's like 
20 words he uses to talk about face and this relationship of face to face. I'm not going to cover all those by any stretch, but this proximity one I think is a useful one as we start to talk about online learning. You don't have to read all of this. Um, so this is Lingus translating Levinas. Um, in the middle here it says proximity appears, which, oops, that's a weird thing. We just talked about the face being that which doesn't appear. But um, anyway, proximity appears as the relationship with the other who cannot be resolved into images or be exposed in a theme, which basically means can't be categorized, right, or something like that. I'm not going to read the rest because it gets really convoluted. But, so proximity is similar to this notion of, of face as we talked about earlier. Um, here, he uses a math analogy um, to talk about proximity, right? So when, when most people think of proximity, at least my understanding is, they think of nearness, yeah? Does that, does that sound, yeah, proximity means we're near each other, yeah? So the, the, I think the really beautiful part of proximity in, in the way that I read it in Levinas is that it does talk about nearness, right? But it's a nearness that never eradicates distance, right? It's, an, it's a nearness that always maintains a distance. Um, and, and, he, and I think there's two distance, there's many distances going on there, but the asymptote, which is not really an analogy that helps for most people because none of us pay attention to math anymore, really, but um, he, he says, Proximity is not an asymptote, folks, right? It's not just a consistent nearness, all getting nearer, 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 right? Proximity is a nearness. It's a relationship with, it's a sociality. He uses all those languages, all that language to talk about it. But the nearer I get, right, the more I am in relationship with one, with a person, with an other, the further away I am from, from being able to be responsible for them, right? Or to know them or to comprehend them. So there's always this, this resistance that the other has, or, or other people have, um, to my ability to master them, or to, to take them into my system fully. They're, they're, proximity says, yes, there's a nearness, but there's always a distance. Um, and I think that's a way for us to think about online learning spaces, right? Or technologies in general, right? So, and there's lots of conversation around this um, in, in, in scholarly circles around, well, are technologies sort of promoting an over nearness, right? So that everything is right at hand, right? So um, we don't have any distance or a healthy distance from things. Or others are saying it's actually isolating us. And somebody put isolation up when we asked that question, right? Is it isolating us so it's all distance and there's not actually any intimacy or nearness, right? So, but I think prox that's what I love about proximity is it's, it's constantly holding the two in tension, right? It's demanding that we're in a relationship of some sort, but not a relationship that collapses one thing into another, right? That keeps this distance, right? So that's, that's proximity. Um, the, the one, just the, the quick way I say that is sociality irreducible to closeness, spatial temporal closeness, or um, things like that. Um, and I think... Proximity is um, another way to say face-to-face. -face. So when I think of face-to-face, -face, I'm thinking proximity. Now, I've decided to use proximate language instead of face-to-face because -face, everybody thinks what I mean by face-to-face -face is we're in a physical room together, right? Where I can smell you, right? So I've changed to use proximate wh when I talk about what I'm looking for in online learning spaces. And that's why you'll see I'm, I want to make an argument for um, the, the classroom as pro proximate, right? Um, so, now I'm a technologist by training, so as I was sort of learning um, and, and working uh, with, with Levinas and trying to figure out sort of how to, how to even relate to this notion of, of the face and proximity, at the same time, I work with interfaces all day long, right? It's what I do um, as a technologist, right? Interface is a very prominent word in the technological space. Right? Um, it, it actually describes almost everything we do technologically. Um, and it's so broad that it's almost unhelpful in some ways. But, um, but I, again, I think interface, one could think, oh, that's a translation of face-to-face, -face, right? Interface. But not quite, I don't think, but many people do the same thing with it. Um, interface comes from the world of science. Anybody know what this is? Ah, that sounds delicious right now. Yeah, it's water and oil, right? Yep. 
so, so the, 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 the oldest definition of interface, right, just so, so we all start in the same place, because I may just assume people know what interface is, but the oldest definition is the scientific definition where it's a, it's a, it's a, a line of encounter between two substances or two phases of the same substance, right? So it is that line of encounter, okay? So there is contact, there's nearness, right? But there's still a distance because neither of the phases or, or of the, the liquids can fully take in the other one, right? So the interface is, is both near and distant, right? Even in science, right? They weren't thinking about all that fancy stuff, but, um, but so the science definition is that. Now, in computing, right, Interface, again, there's a lot of interfaces. Most of what we think about in computing are human computer interfaces, right? So like a keyboard would be a human computer interface, right? Um, my iPhone is a computer interface, a uh, human computer interface, right? Um, the, the, the web browser that we use to access Canvas, that's, a, that's an interface of sorts, right? There are also, like, these are interfaces, these cables, right? And then there's software interfaces that actually have the cable be able to talk to the machine. You know, so it's like a proliferation of interfaces as well, right? So it's a very important term in computing. Um, and I think that it's an incredibly useful term for us to use as we think about what we're doing in imagining online learning spaces as connected to the kinds of learning spaces we have valued for a long time. Um, because I think interface um, has the potential to perform proximity, as we talked about it before, okay? And we'll get, we'll get to more of that. So, um, one of my favorite humans in the world, um, and I like a lot of machines, um, but this is one of my favorite humans. Um, so, Joanna Drucker talks a lot about interface. She's actually argued, and I, I think I shared this essay with folks, if, um, I, not that you read anything, but, so, She's working primarily in the area of, of books and, and academic writing and, and literary writing and things like that and how that um, gets sort of performed in digital spaces. And she has, a, I think, a really rich, she's asked humanities scholars, such as ourselves, to help theorize interface as we move into the digital world. And I think she's got a really nice, I won't read all of this, but, but basically she says many people, particularly in the computing world, Think of interfaces as just things, right? And often as windows, windows, Microsoft Windows, right? As windows to content, right? So the interface, the computer, many people think of it as just a thing that I use to get to another thing. And they miss the materiality, right? And the, the participation they have in that thing, right? So, so Drucker says, what if we thought of interface as event, not just entity, right? So that's her language, right? So what if interface was a more entangled thing, right? So she says here in the middle, the surface of the screen is not merely a portal for access to something that lies behind or beyond, right? Interface, like any other component of computational systems, is an artifact, it's material, of complex, complex processes and protocols, a zone, right? in which our behaviors and actions take place is what we read and how, again, so she's focused on reading here, right? Um, but we can, we can keep thinking about what we learn and how we learn, but we could put it that way in terms of our classrooms, right? Combined through engagement, it's a provocation to cognitive experience. And that last sentence, by the way, I'm not gonna go into this, but that's, I could, I could put that right up next to Levinas and the face, and interface and face would be pretty similar right there, I think. Um, so that's, that's her definition of interface. The way I summarize that, which many people say, this isn't a summary, this is harder than what she says. But I think these terms are important, um, but we don't have to hold all of them. But so she, so for Drucker, uh, the way I read Drucker, um, it, zone of encounter is what she means by interface. It's a zone in which there are things encountering. And that zone of encounter provokes probabilistic production, okay? Zone of encounter that provokes probabilistic production. What she means by production, she has a, a co-constructed notion of the subject. And that's what she's trying to articulate into interfaces, that interface is always co-constructed by users and the materiality of the, the structures of the platforms that are being used. It's a co-constructed space. Both the subject is co-constructed and the platform is co-constructed all at the same time. So that's what she means by pr production, and she, she uses language of event as well. Every time 
that's produced. Right? Every time I use an interface, it's produced. It's new, something like that. Probabilistic, um, she's, she's, she's using probabilistic, uh, I, the way I read the way she's using probabilistic is, is as an alternative to, again, what many people see as computers are this sort of mechanistic determinism. Like, oh, somebody de designs an interface for me to do this one thing, to buy that thing, right? We, we all use interfaces a lot where somebody's demanding me to buy something, right? And so a lot of people think about designing, and even interface designers think, oh, I want to design this so that I know exactly what the user's going to do every time, right? I've been in many of those conversations, design conversations, and I understand the economics behind it, but she's arguing for a notion of interface that is probabilistic, meaning every interface, so every encounter between a user and a platform has a, several possibilities. And each performance of that engagement, right, selects one of those possibilities and enacts it, right? And it's probabilistic. So, so we don't know which one's going to happen each time, but, but that set of possibilities gets performed in the event of interface. Uh, and then provoke, what I think is important about provocation here is that um, the materiality of both the user, I'm going to say user here, and of the platforms are, are part of what construct what is possible, right, um, in an interface. And it demands us to make some sort of selection in that process, right? We have, if we're going to use the interface, we're going to be a part of the interface, then, it, you know, it's provoking us to make some choices. Um, so that's what, that's what I think she's doing with, with interface there. So I'd like to argue for classroom as proximate interface. So classroom as its proximate interface. So I think classrooms are interfaces, right? I mean, it's probably classrooms are proliferations of interfaces, lots of interface going on in here. But, but if the classroom can be imagined, even this one can be imagined as a space, a zone of encounter that provokes probabilistic production, right? Can we imagine this space as that? And a proximate interface, meaning one that resists reduction, right, to just spatial closeness, and re resists reduction to consumption, right? So that's part of what's going on in proximity is um, I can't take in all the things into myself, right? There's always a distance um, in that. So can, we can I make an argument for classroom as proximate interface? There, there are um, three, I I'll call them affordances. Anybody know what an affordance is? Fancy term, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's an opportunity, right? It's a possibility, right? And, and so, and, and affordances, it's a word that comes out of um, psychology in the 70s where they were talking about a possible relationship between a thing and an agent, right? So an environment and an agent, right? So they were talking about with child development and, and animals and things like that. It's been taken into um, human-computer interface um, where it, affordances talk about the perceived possibilities in a human computer interface, right? So uh, the way I use affordance is just the material possibilities given to us as users by a platform, right? So I think these three affordances in interface um, give us the best potential for classroom as proximate interface. High surface area, what do I mean by that? Um, who drinks coffee? Yeah? yeah? Right, many of us here while we're here, right? So coffee, how do we make coffee? Anyone? Do we just take the beans that we get from the store and then run water through the beans? No, what do we do, what do, we do with the beans? Grind them up, right? We grind them up. Why do we, why do we grind them up? Oh, higher surface area. Ah! <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, it's, a, it's just an easy analogy to think through like, oh, okay, the reason we grind them up is because we want the water the hot water, to touch as many surfaces of those beans as possible, right? Because then we get more flavor in, in the drink, right? So um, I think designing interfaces with higher surface area gives us more potential for that interface to be proximate. Um, and we, we can talk about that more later too. Collaboration, the affordance of collaboration. I think there's two kinds of collaboration I'm looking for in proximate interface. One is um, the collaboration between users. Do interfaces um, afford my ability to actually encounter others, other users, right? So that's one kind of collaboration and, and do things together. The other kind of collaboration is back to Drucker's notion of co-construction is do interfaces um, demand that I participate 
in constructing the interface itself, right? So do, do, do platforms um, demand that um, in interface? And then anarchy, uh, I'm gonna sort of blow by this one, we can talk about it later, but, but uh, this one comes more out of my background with um, looking at Bible as interface, but I do think that classroom as interface, if it affords anarchy, it has a better potential to be a proximate interface because often, and I think this happens more, maybe more in online spaces than, than even in um, on-ground spaces, although it happens a lot in on-ground spaces. What I mean by anarchy is not chaos, right? I don't mean some simple notion of disorder. And I get this notion of anarchy from Levinas as well, right? What I mean is um, an interface that it isn't ruled by some notion of origin, right? So that's the play on RK, right? RK can mean both rule, reign, and or beginning, right, in Greek. So I'm taking both together and saying, ah, if an interface is anarchic or affords anarchy, then it's not governed by um, some sort of notion of original or some um, single idea or some one instructor, right? Things like that, one, yeah, something like that. So do, can we have interfaces that don't, aren't reducible to the reign of one thing, one principle, one theme, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the affordances, I, I think, facilitate classroom as proximate interface. Wow, all right. So why, why translating? Back to this again, I sort of talked about this earlier. Why do I talk about translating the classroom? It, it's a design methodology for me, really is what it is. Um, and, and why I use that is because many of our faculty, right, over the last 10 years, they start with already knowing a whole set of things about how to teach in this space, right, in this on-ground space. So rather than me saying, hey, I gotta I got teach you all these new things, right, I know you don't actually wanna do them, but I'm gonna teach you all these new things, and they're new things, so you just have to learn them. Rather than doing that, how about I say, look, Let's take all the things you already know, even the syllabi you've already built, right, for the courses that they're now gonna ask you to teach online. Why don't we take those, and why don't we translate that, and, and I call this a material media translation. Why don't we sort of material media translate that into these online spaces and see how that goes, right? Why don't we ask some hard questions about what are you after in this part of your course, right? Or when you teach this way, what are you after? And is that thing you're after possible online? The answer may be no, right? But it also might be, oh yeah, but we have to think about it more carefully, right? So um, I, I do this, the reason I use translation as a design methodology is to resist the conversion metaphor, which I think is similar to the representation um, or reproduction, it's something closer to resemblance, right? Um, so I, I wanna resist that, I encourage adoption because they actually know they have the skills and it's really just about sort of, mod sort of modulating those skills rather than learning all brand new skills and I can connect to their experience, and I think there's a, it's nice to focus on the materiality of it because, as Beck and I were talking about earlier, every learning space has a different materiality, right? So when we teach a course, right, or build a learning community, we have to take seriously what that materiality is because each materiality will, demand, will have different affordances, and so we'll have to work with those affordances in order to get at the aims we're after. So, for example, if, if I taught an on-ground class, and then my school used one LMS, Blackboard, right? I might translate that course for Blackboard differently than I would for Canvas, a different LMS, right? Um, so those things we have to take into consideration. All right, some examples, and then, um, and then we're gonna get to having you talk a little bit about um, what you think in the translation classroom we need to do in order to translate into these spaces. Because I don't, I don't teach translators in the traditional sense. So you all probably have all the wisdom to say, okay, here's the things we normally do. How are we gonna translate that? So we'll talk about that in a minute. But so what are the things we translate? Um, we talk a lot about presence. It was mentioned earlier, right? That's what we thought face-to-face -face meant, right? Uh, that's maybe bo bothered now, but um, we translate presence both for students and for teachers um, we, and, and, and multiple kinds of presence. Often um, when you're teaching online, um, Students are embedded in a community somewhere else, right? 
um, not necessarily in your, and it's not the monastic um, sort of approach to education anymore, where we all come together and the rest of life is doing its own thing, but they're embedded in their own thing. So how can we get them present there and present in the classroom and, and hold both of those together? Um, and then how do, we, how do we translate teacher presence? Some people don't like video, so they do audio. Um, how do we get, get around presence in there, um, both temporarily and, and using media? Um, space and time, <laughs> it's a big task to translate space and time. Um, but I think this is another thing we need to think about. What, what, are there unstructured spaces and structured spaces in our, in our classroom, online classroom, that we need to figure out how to translate into online? Are they translatable or not? Private and public, both as well. Time, I think, is one of the most critical translational aspects in moving to the online classroom. Um, we have found that be, we have to do something for the online classroom to, to translate the time and space that these walls sort of contain, right? Um, and so we've done a lot of work with regular rhythm in online courses. And that regular rhythm creates the sort of sense of, oh, that's our, that's our classroom, is the regular rhythm, right? So we, we all know we're doing this thing on the same rhythm, so it's almost like a ritual um, that, that sort of helps structure um, that learning space. Some examples of things that, that we have translated, and I can sh I'll show you a few of these, um, and then I'll stop. Because we we'll have time in the workshop to show some of these too, but... Uh, we're a, a graduate institution, so I, I work at a graduate institution that primarily does seminar courses. So again, our faculty were like, how do you do a seminar online, right? Isn't online learning just for content delivery, right? And then, you know, assessment and regurgitation, isn't that what online learning is about? Well, we don't really do any of that, right? All we do is, you know, read stuff together, basically, and then talk about it, right? Um, we do some other things. They would be mad if, I, if they heard me say that. We do other things than that. But a lot of what we do is seminars. And so we had to, it took us a few years to work really hard to figure out how to structure online asynchronous conversations to, to, to be a, a meaningful translation of that seminar um, room. And again, there are, there are things that aren't the same um, in that experience. But I think we've gotten to a place where I think some of our faculty prefer the conversations they have online to the ones they have around the table. Yeah, which yeah, we can talk about that. We can talk. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you some of what they say. Um, um, partly, it is um, you hear more voices often, right? Loud people like me don't dominate as much uh, because when you're in an asynchronous environment, um, everybody's actually required to contribute, right? And we used to give people credit for just showing up in the room, right? And then we assumed that they had you know sort of already done all the other things, right? But so they hear more voices. A lot of students are more careful about their contributions, um, and so they get more substantial um, participation. Now, the, the downside to that is you can, you can lose some of the spontaneity that can happen in smaller seminar rooms, and that's the part that's still pretty difficult for folks to translate. We have some ways we're doing it, I think, but um, that's where they often talk about, wow, we don't get that sort of like, oh, somebody did this, and then bam, 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 you know, how you sort of run a, a track, and you're like, oh, I never thought we'd go there. That's a little harder in the asynchronous because there could be a four hour gap before somebody responds to a, a post or something like that. So that, that's one thing we've worked really hard at and I've actually in our course, and I'll show you this in the, in the workshop, in our, in our NIDA Canvas space, I've put in the, um, the, the online discussion guidelines that I wrote up for our folks and many of them use in, in our courses and you can take it and use, use it um, however you want if it, if it seems like it'd be useful. Um, breakout groups, again, a lot of people think, well, how do you do small groups online? It's actually quite easy to do small groups online. Um, and there are lots of fun ways to do small groups online. Um, and Canvas has lots of ways to do that. The lecture, translating a lecture, I mean, should we lecture anymore? I mean, I've been standing up here for a long time talking, and it's the afternoon, it's warm, we ate, everybody's tired. You're very sweet, paying attention, by the way. Um, do, do we want to even translate the lecture? I've been arguing against it, but we translate it all the time. Um, and a lot of what we do, this is where high surface area plays a big role in our design. Um, I, I ask faculty to never post a lecture longer than seven minutes. So if they have lectures that are 45, that's fine. Break it into chunks, higher surface area. Smaller bits, right? Students can take little bits at a time, or they can jump in at different parts, right? Things like that. And that's been wildly successful for us. 
Um, there's a tool I'll show you in the workshop, uh, or when we have time some of these weeks. Um, there's a new video tool in Canvas that actually allows folks to comment in line in video. Um, so you, you, can, you can be watching a video and at any point you can add a comment and it floats in the video and then you can have a whole conversation around it. It's pretty awesome. So lectures we're translating. Um, the syllabus um, is a thing that's entirely translatable um, and it, it can do a lot of really useful things. Um, you can't really see all those words though. Let's see if I can um, zoom a little bit. Hang on. Oh, wrong way. By the way, the tool I'm using is Prezi if those, for those of you who have never used it. Um, happy to show you that too. Um, so I, that, I talked about lecture syllabus. Um, it becomes very object oriented, the syllabus does in online spaces um, as a translation. It's very activity driven and you can deduplicate a lot of work. Um, we as a, as a theological school, uh, probably everybody does this, but we, we do a lot of close reading in our classes, right? Um, and uh, we do a lot of group, group close reading. And so we've used this tool called Hypothesis. Anybody use that? No? Yeah, it's another tool I'd love to show you. I think it's an amazing tool. Um, it's a web annotation tool that we use to, to focus um, collaborative close reading um, in our classes. Uh, and they can do it online wherever they are, whenever they want, things like that. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things we translate. Again, I'll show you some of those things um, when we get into the workshops. Um, and before we get to this discussion, so all I'm going to do is tee up our discussion and then we can, we can talk about all kinds of other things too if you want, because I'm, I'm almost out of time. But well, let me just frame what's coming next. So after the coffee break, we're going to come back, well, for those of you who do come back. And I have built everybody in here their own course in Canvas. I didn't build anything, I just created an empty course for you, and you're the teacher of it. So in NIDA's Canvas instance, you all have a space to do whatever you want with it, right? So what I'd love to see, um, and I would love to be a resource for this for the next two weeks, is you build, take, one of, take a course you've taught before, right? And let's, let's build it out, let's build part of it out in, in Canvas and see if it's translatable, right? See, see where the, the, the hard parts are, right? And where are the parts like, oh, I never imagined I could do that, right? In, in, in an online space. And so, so you all have your own space. Um, what we'll do after the break is figure out how to get into that course, make sure everybody can, and then I'll show you the basics of, how many people have used Canvas before NIDA? Right? So some people use it at their institutions. So there's some other folks who, who can help as well. But I'll show you some of the basics of design, and we'll show some examples. Becca's going to show an example of one of her courses, too. And then we can start talking about, OK, how does this look? OK, so in the translation classroom, how, what are we going to have to do? What are the things that are going to be difficult? Or what are the opportunities for translating the translation classroom? <laughs> yeah, so yes, let's just call it now we're in the Q&A. Okay. Yeah, so we're in the Q&A now. So you can, you can ask everything you want, but first, I would like, I mean, maybe we don't have anything to say about this. Maybe I'm even framing the question wrong or unhelpfully, but I do think each subject has particular things, right, that you do in those classrooms, right? And, and I don't, I don't design translation courses, right? So what I want to know from you all are, what are you imagining are the things that are going to be hard or great to translate into online classroom spaces, in the translation classroom? Well, I have something. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I use a lot in my translation classes is comparative Yep. side by side, but you could do that with many more yep. and in many more ways. So that, that's something that I would be really interested yeah. in. Yeah. 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 And then what do you do with the comparative thing, with the comparative translation? What do they do on the page? They, who are they? Your students. Oh, my students, uh, they discuss the choices. Ah, yeah. And then also yeah. they often yeah. create their own version. Ah, yeah, cool. Very cool. Okay, great. So that, yeah, that seems like something that would be amazing, 
to think through how to translate that online. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You have to say what? Ah. Um, that sounds. That sounds Well, but this is, I think this, but, and we may, all, we may have different approaches in the classroom to this, but one thing that I have found over and over again is, uh, one, of the, one of the learning uh, things for me in, in designing online is, any time we would have been in a, an on-ground classroom and we would have said, oh, by the way, I want you to focus on this, we have to figure out how to do that out here. And often, again, higher surface area, Smaller bits of content, right, out here, more directive content out here in the online spaces tends to have, um, tends to be better um, in terms of students be knowing what they need to do, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to do that. You can still do this sort of free-for-all, um, and that's very possible, but, but a lot of times what our faculty are doing is, you know, instead of giving, uh, let's say, two pages of an essay for them to sort of annotate, it'll be a paragraph right, or two sentences, and they'll say, look, what I want you to focus on are these things, right, or they'll break them into groups and have them focus on separate things so they're teaching each other, um, all in the online space. So smaller bits, again, can help with the focus, yep. What else, what other things, translating, translation classrooms? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. Yep, yep, yep. I think that's an opportunity, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. We've seen that over and over again. Yep. What else? Yep. Oh, oh, sorry, yep. Ah. Methods, yeah. Yeah, how do you, how do you translate the methodologies? What were you going to say, Tom? No, I was going to suggest we have a space to um, do what's called a protocol of translation. And mm -hmm. we actually, so body commentary on of what, what was going on while we were thinking. Ah. Because that's something you, 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 you lose when you just compare product. Yeah. Um, and process of translation, is that what you're saying? There's more space for that? Yes, yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I love it. Or just the idea of process versus product. Really yeah, important. yeah. Uh, process versus product, yep. Yeah. Good. Because sometimes you don't have time to do that, right, in, a, in an on-ground classroom, right? Because you're constrained. Often you think things have to all happen when you're together. Although, we talked about the flipped classroom. Right. Was that today? That was this morning? Was yesterday. Yesterday, yesterday, yeah. So some people are flipping that, right? So that, that's, I don't like the, name, the notion of flipping, but it makes me nauseous. I'm just kidding. What else? Any other things we translate in in the particular to the translation classroom that are challenging? Time management. Huh? Time management. Time management. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty. That's a difficult one for sure. What about like interpreting? How would you how would you teach interpreting? It's possible. Not. Yeah, I hear yes. No, I hear no. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's the question, right? It's like, oh, well, maybe that's not going to work, but maybe it would. What would you need in order to do that? What's that? Yeah, yeah, you can discuss principles. Could you, can you actually practice? Yeah, yeah, theoretical aspects for sure, yep. But what, could, could you actually practice it? Yeah, right? Yeah, which would be amazing, I think. 
Um, principles. Uh, you, think that you can use um, you can use audio and video. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we can say practice. Yeah. Yep. So it may be that, I mean, it may be by and large that the translation classroom is like any other classroom. Same challenges, same opportunities. There may not be anything particular, but you all will know that. I won't. Um, what's that? Yeah. 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 As long as you can get audio, right? Yeah. And you can get video, too. Um, in fact, like Canvas has a, other tools have this too, but the, in everywhere you can type in Canvas, you can do audio or video as well. Um, even in the gradebook as well, you can do it, so you could actually assess their audio or video as an assessment thing if you needed assessment, that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's all very doable now. You can't smell them, right? That's still not there. Traceability and follow-up? Yeah, I don't know what you mean by trace. In the interaction with the students, yeah. how, do you, how do you trace uh, each student's contribution? Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is, I'm going to put that in challenges for sure. Traceability. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of possibility for that. Some people would say, that there's also the flip side of that, like, well, there's no privacy, right? Yeah. Like, students, you see everything they do in the classroom, yeah. right? Everything yeah. now. So, I mean, there's, there's a trade-off there, so, you know, you sort of have to negotiate it. And the other question there is, if you're using tools that push them beyond the learning management system, which I would, I would suggest doing because we want to open up things, students have to be aware that they may be stepping into public spaces, right? And often we have an assumption that our classroom space is a private space, right? So that's another, that's another skill to learn, both for you and for students, is when are you moving in and out of, I mean, I'm, I, I love, I'm, I'm frarian in a lot of ways, right? So get the hell out of the classroom, right? Get into public spaces, right? Learn wherever you are, but <laughs> people don't often, they don't always think that, oh, now I'm in a public space, Right, so I can't say some of the things I maybe would say in a private space. We have to we have to learn that disposition. Yeah, Daniel. I don't want to be relevant, so for me to talk about a different kind of environment, but uh, um, just in the class, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about uh, Bluefire or a tool like Bluefire. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what Daniel's talking about is um, um, a community knowledge based tool called Bloomfire. Um, some of you may have used it. Um, it's primarily in the American market, so by and large. So I, I, folks may not have seen it because um, I think it was primarily designed for American businesses. But we, we've used it for four years, something like that now, five? Yeah, five years. Say again, what? Map.bloomfire.com is that URL? What, what did, you, what, did you say something? No, you didn't? Oh, you did. Map.bloomfire, B L O O M F I R E.com. Um, and so, so, are you asking about the differences between this and. and Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, what, I think tools like this are really good tools. This would be an example of a tool that would um, usually be outside of a private learning space and has all kinds of collaborative potential um, and can take on a life of its own. It's very anarchic in the way in which I sort of meant anarchic, anarchic earlier, right? It's not moderated it's not ruled by any sort of author or you know it, it just happens people do what they want to do and things go different directions so it is and, but it's very unstructured 
Um, and some people don't like that. It's driven by search, and some people want something more structured. So we often find a balance between the structured learning space where we have the curricular design, and then having unstructured spaces where people are sharing resources on their own um, and, and having conversations on their own. James, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So would you not use map or not recommend map or train really in classroom? Ah, uh, I see what you're saying now. Okay. Well, um, where's going back to here? I think so that. I tried to use it for classes before, but I just have to have you know URLs already picked out. Because, yeah. You know, you can't yeah. So um, an unstructured space like Bloomfire or another knowledge-based tool. Um, can be challenging as uh, uh, your only online classroom space. It certainly can be an online learning space, but if you're, if you're trying to do structured design for, for a learning space, um, it's not really designed well for that. Um, it's designed better for um, a bit more ad hoc community sourced learning. Um, people do use uh, parts of it for, uh, as an LMS, learning management system, but No, not quite. It's closer to Facebook than Canvas, maybe. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be great for something like this because Bloomfire being for math increases the interface exponentially that I've never had because yeah. you could bring in yeah. on a translation pedagogy thing and yeah. have amazing resources yeah. around the world. Yeah. Questions yeah. from all those who are practicing yeah. that yep. poured into this rich environment. Yeah. Yep, so it has a lot of collaborative possibilities, which I think, is, so another point that we have learned, another translation um, point that we have learned in terms of uh, kinds of activities for students, one of the things that's happened, right, with online learning is students find their information all over the place. They no longer necessarily think that I, as the instructor, bring them all the information, right? So they can find stuff all over the place. So we spend a lot more time developing the capacity for curation than we do just giving them all the resources. Does that make sense, the difference? Right, so often, I mean again, usually we just said here are all the readings, um, here's everything, you just need to do this sort of stuff and then we'll talk about it, right? Now we're spending a lot more time trying to cultivate their own values around curation. So how, how do they decide which resources are valuable and which aren't? Where do they find them? How do they evaluate those resources, right? Rather than us just telling them, well these are the things to read, you know? So that's been a big shift for us as well curation. Um, thank you. This is helpful. I think this is a good start for us to get moving toward you all building courses. Are there questions about the larger framework of this whole thing? This classroom as approximate interface, translating the classroom, things you want to, things you want me to go back to, terminology that wasn't clear, probably a lot of that. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm happy to show you how to use Prezi anytime. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's qu now you can ask any questions you want. You could have before too, but. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. It's, it's such a crazy notion. Uh, Zoom, you know, Zoom conferencing tool has tried to enhance the notion of face to face. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk, it zooms in on your face. It yeah. captures your expression. Uh -huh. You're trying to make yeah. a virtual face to face reality. It's really a yeah. facial aesthetic. I mean, that's not my question. I'm 
Zoom. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Zoom's one of the video conferencing tools, yeah, that's what he's talking about. Yeah, so uh, yes, I think that um, one of the aspects of that is just the fact that, you know, the, the, the disposition that has been shaped in most internet users these days is that they don't watch long form video, right? In fact, they'll listen to audio more long form, the research suggests, they'll listen to audio more long form than they will watch video, right? Makes sense, in one sense, audio is more portable, right? People think they can multitask when they do audio. Right? Video, so one of the reasons we choose video over audio is it demands more focus, right? So we tend to preference short video over audio because people, they listen to audio in the car, that sort of thing. The people who listen over and over again to audio, that really helps, but we, we preference video because it's more focused, but you have to have it shorter because the disposition is not to watch long form. People record long videos for themselves, right? Like instructors do that because they're used to talking for that long about a topic, right? So it, that's a tricky business. Um, a lot of our faculty still do 40 minute videos. And now we have stats on how far students watch. You wanna know how far it is? It's not even seven. Yeah, it's lower than seven. Most of it, sometimes it's two, three, sometimes it's five, depends on how good it is. But so if we break up those videos, right, they actually watch more overall, right? So it, 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 we have data to suggest that that's, that's yes, Becca. What, so what kind of assessment tools are they using in, at your institution? I'm just curious, because with the seminar, mm -hmm. usually you write a long paper, yep. right? Yep. Um, we still do a lot of that. OK. Are there other assessment tools that you're using? Yeah, so um, the, the primary, uh, assessment model of our courses is huge. It, it's, it's typically papers of some sort, sometimes short form, sometimes long form. Um, we have a lot more people doing peer review along the way, so they get, again, process over product. They're, they're building that into their classrooms because Canvas has such a nice peer review tool. Um, we do have some people doing um, like either survey slash quizzing sort of things, um, but then they do a lot of work figuring out, oh, actually, we have a lot of faculty doing self-assessment now, by the way. Um, where they don't actually give grades, people grade themselves, and the faculty have a, they have a way in at the end, but um, I would say 30% of our instructors now use self-assessment almost exclusively um, in, in our sort of classrooms. But um, the, the other thing we're trying, people are trying to figure out is how they assess participation, because discussions are such a huge part of what we do online. Um, faculty are trying to fix, so, so some faculty will actually grade discussions on a rubric each week. Um, and that sort of thing, yeah. So, so that's the other form of assessment they use is, is rubrics, things like that, yeah. Yeah, about video. Into, yeah. into an online yeah. class. It's a great question. I actually asked one of my first questions uh, when you said our perspective was could you just give us another lecture or the other weeks of webinar that you didn't talk about? <laughs> and so that we know we yeah. get more. Yeah. And, and yeah. Johanna's structure, because I think that's her out, and she was very interesting. 
She's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Great question, it's a great question. Um, and it's hard, I think it's hard. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I think it's difficult. Because, so I've done this, and, and the, the, ways, the ways I tend to approach that kind of subject matter in an online learning space is I work really hard, it may not be seven minutes, it may be like nine, you know, or something like that, but I work really hard to make smaller bits out of the material, and then hang it together in ways, right, so that students can get long form if they want it, right? If that's what works for a student. Like, so for example, YouTube playlists, right? Uh, if anybody's ever used one of those, right? So basically you can, you can have a whole bunch of videos that will just keep playing one after another, right, in order, right? If somebody wants to do that, but they're actually discrete bits, right? Um, with breakpoints so people can stop and go reflect. And, and so often what I do, so I'll do that for them, so that if they want to listen for, you know, 50 minutes straight, they can. Um, often, I'm, sometimes I record that long, right, I'll record for 45 minutes, and then I'll chop up the video, right, and just put it up in bits, right. I don't often do that anymore because I, I like having trans transitions um, rather than just chopping up somewhere, you know, sort of thing. Um, so anyway, I think it's hard work to do, but I think you can do it for any sort of high philosophical thing, but you have to be super focused. And often what I like to do is do um, a more multimedia curation for each of the little topics. So basically, I'll do like a seven, seven minute video, usually five to seven, right? Um, and often all I'm doing there is setting up the bits that I've given them to engage. So there'll be some readings there, right? Some other videos from other people to watch, um, things like that. Um, so my video is not content for them as much as it is framing what they're gonna see and then clarifying a few key terms, um, perhaps. And then, um, after that content, um, the, the very next thing we do is a close reading together, usually, of one short passage that has, usually has a, a bunch of the terms in there that, that are problematic or difficult, that sort of thing. So we'll do, and again, it'll be like a paragraph at most that we'll do really close reading with. I'll have them annotate that first, and then I'll come in and participate that and say, oh, well remember, we saw this term back here. What did it mean there? Right? Is it the same now, or is it that sort of stuff? Uh, and then we'll have, often after that, after the close reading, we'll have a larger conversation about the bigger ideas. Um, but it may take doing six of those in a week, right? To get all of that content for the sort of high philosophical stuff, and that's a ton of work, right? So, so if anybody tells you online is easier to do, they're wrong. If they tell you it's cheaper, your institution, if they say it's cheaper, they're wrong. They're just flat wrong. Right? To do this well is hard work, right? Uh, and, and it takes, uh, I think it's a more collab, I, what I want it to be is a more collaborative effort between instructors and technologists who care about making these spaces so that you don't have to do all that work, so that people like me would do some of that work for you so you can focus on engaging students, right? That's the model that I think institutions need in order to make this effective so that it's actually human and not dehumanizing. You're not satisfied with that answer. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. I was just going to say, what's the impact on the students' teaching? Okay. Yeah. When you break up, everything into five slides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. But in the normal run, uh -huh. how is this teaching survive? Oh, our only hope is to attach to machines. No? Which we already started. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not quite totally kidding, but um, that's a great question. Um, I think we should keep talking about that. I think it's a great question. Are we done? There's people who. Um, we have lots of interest, and in what I need to know from you is will you be providing us more space for this QA? Yeah, we can, we can start the next session with 